We just signed a lease on our house hack. What is up everyone? Lauren here. Kyle is not joining us in this video because property management is my lane and he don't need to be here. I mean, he's actually sitting right here <laughs> doing the prompter for me, but forget about it. Welcome to a long and detailed video on how to find, screen, and onboard tenants for your rentals. I tried to shorten it, but I just have so much to share. So if you're looking for a particular stage of the process and don't want to watch this whole video, check out the chapters listed below and feel free to jump around to the part that's most valuable to you. If you subscribe to our channel, then you guys know that we're wrapping up renovations on our house hack and we are so excited to place a tenant and get those rent checks coming in. And if you're not subscribed, why? Hit that subscribe button and the like button while you're at it and let's dive into it. When filling a vacancy, my goal is to get the most qualified prospects to apply. Now I didn't say to get the most leads or to get the most people to come for a tour, Quite the opposite actually. I'd rather show the unit to three qualified prospects than 20 tire kickers. And in this video, I'm gonna show you the system that we use to do just that. A quick disclaimer before we dive in, please be sure to check your landlord tenant laws specific to your state and do not take anything I say in this video as legal or financial advice. Good? Good. The first step is to create a listing. There are many websites you can use to create and syndicate your listing. And I like to use a mix of a few of them. The first location is your property management website. We used to use apartments.com and just recently switched to TurboTenant. If this is your first rental, I recommend researching a few options before deciding on one. I could do a whole other video on uh, management software, but that's for another day. Each management platform will post your listing to a few different sites. TurboTenant does Realtor.com, RentPath, Zumper, ApartmentList, Rent.com, and a few others. On top of all these, I also like to post to Zillow, Trulia, and Facebook Marketplace. And looking back at our stats, we've actually gotten most of our applicants from Facebook, Trulia, and Zillow. But you need a listing to post, so let's back up a little bit and talk about what to include. Any great listing is gonna need high quality photos of every room in the home. Many people are gonna say that you shouldn't use your phone and that you should hire a professional, but if you have a newer smartphone and a basic understanding of angles and access to editing apps, I think a phone is just fine and that's what we use for our rentals. So after cleaning up a little bit, I walk around the house and I take a few shots of each room. I also like to show the rooms in order that a person would walk through the house and show entryways and hallways in the photos so that a potential renter can really get a sense of the floor plan. Natural light is your friend. So midday when the sun is out is the ideal time to take photos. I hate when there are hard sun rays coming in through the windows, so I try to avoid morning and late at night. If you can't take photos during the day and don't have ample interior light options, I do recommend bringing your own light source. Lighting makes a huge difference and you could pick up a light kit on Amazon for less than 100 bucks. Make sure you also take photos of all of the key features. Is there a smart thermostat? Get a picture of it. Washer and dryer? Take a picture. Large fenced in yard? You better believe I'm including a picture of it. The more information you provide, the more people can envision themselves in your home and obsess over it. Once you've got the photos, I edit them one by one in an app called Snapseed. I generally increase the brightness, edit out items I missed or imperfections with the healing tool, and I'll usually use the HDR scape tool to even out the lighting. Export them and throw them on your computer. Photos are edited, now we write the listing. You wanna start with a visual statement that includes some basic details. For our unit, I wrote, this four bedroom twin was gutted to the studs and completely renovated, ready for you to call home. This lets them know how many bedrooms, what type of property it is, and that everything is brand new. Then I continue. Enter from the new front porch into the first floor, featuring open concept living with a large living room, dining room, and brand new kitchen with white shaker cabinets, quartz countertops, and plenty of storage. 
Off the kitchen is a huge closet, half bath, and washer dryer. The second floor has three nice sized sun filled bedrooms and a full bath. The third floor has a large bonus room and a fourth bedroom. Off the back of the house is a brand new deck with a large fenced in yard, short walk to Main Street with many shops and restaurants. Dogs are welcome, full unfinished basement for storage, off street parking for two cars, and easy access to major roadways. Now, while you do wanna provide as many details of the property and the area as possible, you also need to make sure that you're only writing facts and not opinions. Nationwide, it's against the law to discriminate against race or color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. And then in New Jersey, they take it a step further and you also can't discriminate against pregnancy or breastfeeding, sexual orientation, liability for military service, marital status, and source of income. So for example, your property might be in a town with an amazing school district, and while you may be tempted to include great for families, you're now indirectly discriminating against interested parties with no school-aged children, which falls under familial status. Besides a description of the property, you also want to include the lease terms, like how much is security deposit, if utilities are included, and any other lease details. You don't want there to be any surprises with the applicant. We do one and a half month for security deposit, but check your state laws for yours. One year lease, dogs are okay, no cats, and tenant pays all utilities, including water and sewer. And finally, you want to include your minimum rental standards. This is where the pre-screening begins, and I start that system that I mentioned earlier. You can include things like a minimum credit score you're willing to accept, salary requirements, occupancy maximums, smoking parameters, and your pet policy. We typically say good rental and credit history, income of three times one month's rent, and X person max occupancy. That really just depends on how many bedrooms you have in your home and how big the bedrooms are. By including this in your listing, you're letting interested parties know what you're looking for in the application. And if the person doesn't meet these minimums, they'll usually disqualify themselves and typically won't reach out about the property, which increases the percentage of qualified leads. Once I have all the details added, I'll post it on TurboTenant, Zillow, Trulia, and Facebook Marketplace. Now let the leads come rolling in. All right, but now what? <laughs> now the pre-screening continues. Every single lead I receive gets the same response. Treating each lead the same exact way is very important in following fair housing laws. So they all get this canned response. Hey, insert person's name here. Thank you so much for your interest in this property. Please complete this form. Once completed, I will reach out with the next steps. I actually have this response automated in Facebook Marketplace. So you can just go to your company's page, click on inbox, and then automated responses in the top right. Here, you can create and turn on instant reply. So I paste in the canned response and a link to the form, and now I don't have to manually respond to each person. You can also set up automatic replies within Gmail, but that can kind of get a little complicated if you have existing tenants or other people emailing that email address, so I don't do that. In this form though are my pre-screening questions. This helps me see if a tenant will meet our minimum rental standards and settles any confusion over the property before they even come for a tour. Again, you have to be careful with the questions you ask, so I mimic the ones asked on the application. For example, name, email, phone number, gross verifiable annual income, credit score range, I don't ask them for their specific number, eviction history, bankruptcy history, and then questions about pets, number of people that'd be living here, and ideal move-in date. I just use Google Forms for this currently, but some platforms actually have a built-in pre-screener you could use. This is another step in the process where people will actually disqualify themselves. If they see our minimum rental standards listed and know they don't meet them, they typically won't even complete the form, and because I'm asking, they know I'm gonna check. At the end of every day, I'll review all of the completed forms and respond to each person. If they meet our standards, I'll schedule a tour. If they don't, 
I'll say, based on the information you provided, it seems you don't meet our minimum rental standards in X category. I will ask follow-up questions just to see if maybe there was some confusion or if they filled the information wrong, um, but typically that conversation will end there. Once I have a few qualified prospects, I'll batch the tours together. I personally don't like open house style showings, which I know a lot of people do because people feel that since they aren't committing to a specific time, that it's just okay for them not to show up. So I schedule tours in 15 minute increments, one day on the weekend and one day during the week in the evening to give everyone a shot to make it. I'll also offer a video walkthrough to anyone who can't come. To ensure I don't waste my time, I actually withhold the exact address until the day of the showing. I message them the morning of confirming the tour and I'll say something like, looking forward to meeting you later today for a tour at 6 p.m. Once you confirm, I'll send you the address. This way, if they don't respond, I know they're not coming and there's no way for them to just show up because they don't have the exact address. This also prevents people from driving by days before the tour and disturbing any existing tenants. During the showings, I give each person a tour of the property, pointing out the key items I mentioned before, like the smart features, washer dryer, fenced in yard, etc. And then I let them walk around themselves and take pictures. I also bring a tape measure with me and offer to take any measurements for them so they can envision their furniture and just make sure everything's gonna fit. If Kyle's with me, I'll walk him around the whole house, including the basement and the upper floors. If he's not, I'll stay in the living room the whole time and let them look around themselves and then I'll verbally just list the key features when they're finished. I have watched too many murder mysteries to be caught alone in a basement with a stranger, so if Kyle's not here, I ain't going. I reiterate the lease terms, our minimum rental standards, and answer any questions they have. And after the tour, I let every single person know that if they would like to submit an application to let me know and I'll send them a link. You have to offer an application to every person. Again, you have to be careful with what you say or questions you ask. You obviously want to get to know them, but you can't ask questions that could be construed as discriminatory down the line. For example, if we have both units and an up down duplex available and someone comes to tour the property in a wheelchair, I can't say, oh, the first floor, you know, be perfect for you as it's more accessible. If they want to apply for the second floor unit, give them an application. Because by New Jersey state law, I don't know about the rest of the country, if a person with a disability rents a unit, they're allowed to make structural changes to that unit they occupy to make it more functionally accessible for their use and enjoyment at the tenant's own expense. And as a landlord, I can require that the tenant return the premise back to its original state when they vacate the unit, but I have to allow them to make the changes to begin with. All right, back to the prospective tenant application journey. I know guys, we're covering a lot. I use the applications that are built into the property management software, which in this case is TurboTenant. The application fee paid by the tenant is $45 a person. And you wanna have every individual that would reside in the unit that's 16 years of age or older to complete the application because each application includes a credit and background check. And even though an 18 year old adult may not be responsible for the rent if they're still living with their parents, you do wanna know their criminal history. The checks typically take anywhere from one hour to two days to process. And once all the applications are complete, then I'll review them all at once. I screen every application the same exact way. Are you guys getting a theme here? You have to be very consistent when screening tenants. I'm looking for information to confirm three things. That you have the financial means and history to pay rent on time each month. That you will not cause any harm or disturbance to me or any of the other tenants. And that you're gonna keep the unit and property clean and returned in the same condition minus wear and tear upon move out. All right, so how do I do that? Well, first, I start with the basic information. You know, just look at the name, number, email address, desired move-in date, how many co-applicants there are, and make sure that it all just matches up with previously information given, either on the pre-screener or verbal in conversation. Then I look at employment. Is the salary three times one month's rent? Is it verifiable income with attached pay stubs? How long have they been at this job? I'll call the current employer and confirm all this information. Then I look at the credit profile. 
Now the score itself doesn't mean that much to me because I know it doesn't paint a whole picture. You could have high medical bills or maybe you went through a rough patch like five years ago. But what does matter to me is over the past year or so, have you paid your bills on time? This information should make me confident that you are financially capable and responsible enough to pay rent on time every month. I also check to make sure you haven't had any evictions in recent years, but that should go without saying. You are doing so great. Okay, I'm on deal. Wait, that was... There we go. Match up the elbows, people. Then I look at criminal background check. First and foremost, I'm looking to see if you were honest with me. In the pre-screener, I'll ask the applicants if they have a criminal history. And if they say no, and then I find out that they do have recent charges in the background check, now, you know, we're starting the relationship off on the wrong foot here. Transparency and respect go a long way. I'm only looking for crimes that fall within New Jersey's new Fair Chance and Housing Act. In this act, New Jersey landlords can only consider crimes of first degree within six years, second or third degree crimes within four years, and fourth degree crimes within one year. Check your state laws before reviewing the background check results. Make sure you're doing everything right. Now, we understand a criminal history can have a lot of nuances. So I'm primarily looking for violent crimes because my main objective is to ensure that you won't harm myself, any of my team members, or any other tenants. And the last main thing I'm looking for is that you will care for the home and keep it in good condition. This is more difficult to quantify because cleanliness doesn't have a verifiable score, but I have heard of some people looking at the tenant's car when they show up for the tour and see what the inside looks like, is it messy? Or they'll go drive by their current residence or even stop by and see how it's being kept. We haven't done that yet, but we do call current and past landlords and get their feedback. Again, you have to ask the same questions to each reference to keep things fair, but I will ask them to verify their rental details. Again, I'm checking to see if they're honest with me. If the tenant paid rent on time each month, if the landlord had any issues with the tenant, and the condition of the property during annual inspections and upon vacating, and if they would rent to the tenant again. That last one's my favorite question as it always provides such valuable information. Now, make sure you call past landlords too, not just their current landlord. If the tenant's moving because the current landlord's kicking them out, of course they're gonna give you a glowing review of them because they want them out of their unit and they want them to be your problem and not theirs. The last thing I'll do is a good old Google search. I'm just looking for information that could help me make an informed decision. For example, we had someone apply once and they said that they didn't have any pets. Well, a recent post on Facebook said otherwise. So it can be a helpful tool. Hopefully after you review all of the applications, you're picking between the best of the best and any choice would be a great one. So I just think back, based on the data, who is most likely to pay rent on time, who will be the least likely to cause any issues, and who is going to care for the home the best. All right, that sounds great, but what happens if no one meets your minimum rental standards? A few things. You either have unreasonable expectations for the location of the property or the condition of the unit, or you need to be more patient. Don't ever rush to fill a vacancy. Think with your mind, not with your wallet. Foregoing a month's rent is far better than placing a bad tenant. Think of every bad landlord-related experience or story that you've heard. It usually revolves around a bad tenant. They aren't paying. They damaged the property. They called me at 2 a.m. So analyze your property correctly, offer a quality product, and screen accordingly. So you chose an applicant. This is so exciting. But now you gotta deliver not only the good news, but also the bad news. For the applicants that we're rejecting, we message them letting them know that their application has not been accepted because of X. And we do share whatever the reason is, such as poor credit history or poor landlord reference. And for the applicants that we approve, I send them an email congratulating them on their new home and outlining the next steps, such as lease signing and fund collection. For lease signing, we used to do this in person, but now I do it digitally but the lease isn't the only thing that gets signed or delivered. In New Jersey, we also have to include a lead-based paint disclosure, a pet addendum if needed, 
a W-9 form so I could set up a landlord-tenant account for their security deposit, a protect your family from lead-based paint pamphlet, a truth in renting pamphlet, and a tenant's guide to window guard safety. Again, I know I sound like a broken record, but please check your local laws on what you have to include. Almost every one of our tenants has said to me, oh, my last landlord didn't send us any of this. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, your last landlord broke the rules. So I load all of these things into DocuSign. I fill in all of the tenant specific information, assign initials and signatures where needed, and I send it off. I also request payment for both the security deposit and first month's rent. Depending how much time we have between lease signing and the start date dictates how I accept payment. If the move-in date is less than two weeks away, I require a certified bank check. If we have more time, like in this instance, we have over a month, I'll charge them electronically through TurboTenant. Either way, I let them know that I will not take the listing down until payment is received and deposited into my account. We learned this the hard way. We actually accepted a tenant, signed the lease, but she showed up with a personal check. But because we had over a month before her move-in date, I accepted the personal check with the assumption that it would clear within a few days. Very long story short, the check bounced, duh. And after many failed attempts of meeting up with them for a certified check, the money never came. So we avoided the lease, had to find a new tenant, and it all worked out in the end, but it was a mistake that I will never make twice. So rent goes into our rental property operating account and the security deposit goes into a separate property specific landlord tenant savings account that I mentioned before. All right guys, I know there's a lot. It's dark outside. We started when there was sun coming into this room, but let's keep moving on. All right, we got the lease signed. The money's in our account. The tenants are packing their bags. Now what do we do? Now I'm gonna take a second for a little shameless plug. Kyle and I put so much effort into making these videos and providing what we know for free to you. So if you're finding these at all valuable, it would mean so much to us if you'd hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. That will help us grow the channel and in turn help us make more videos for you. All right, but for real, now what do we do? Well, we set everyone up for success. I send the new tenants a copy of the fully executed lease and load it into their tenant portal on TurboTenant and I ask them to do three things prior to move in. One, call the local utility company and have the service transferred into their name starting on their move-in date. Two, transfer or acquire renter's insurance and send me a copy. And three, schedule setup for cable or internet and I'll usually provide them with their local service options. There's usually a few weeks of quiet with the occasional question or two, but then it is move-in day. <laughs> the night before move-in, I send the tenants a code to a lockbox on their new front door with two sets of keys. This is how they gain access because nope, I'm not there, but I do make sure that I'm available for any phone calls as they get settled in. I also email them a move-in condition report. This is a detailed report of the condition of the home, noting any major scratches on the floors or dings in the walls, and then the tenant has 72 hours to notify me of any additional damages that maybe I missed and didn't include on the sheet. I'll add any of those changes to the sheet and then we'll both sign it. This is super helpful for when they move out because not only do I have photos now of the unit before they moved in, but I also have a signed document so there's no confusion. I used to do a welcome packet with a binder on the counter with information about the house in the neighborhood, but that kind of got to be a lot. So now I just send them an email with key information like trash schedule, recycling rules, links to how to use the smart thermostat, and where they can find the water and gas shut up valves in case of an emergency. I also include instructions on how to submit a maintenance request and I remind them of some notable lease terms like who's responsible for the lawn, snow removal, pests, and other stuff like that. Something that we do that is almost as controversial as holiday gifts and carpet in bedrooms is a tenant welcome basket. Now it's nothing crazy, but we do include a few items like toilet paper, garbage bags, furniture floor pads, you know, to protect our floors, and a little gift based off of conversations that we've had with them. So for example, our tenant moving into this place next month has a dog, so I'll be adding in some dog treats or a bone. 
Some people think this is creating a blurred line between landlord and tenant, but we see the tenants as our clients and offering good customer service is very important to us. Hopefully everything goes smoothly, but if I didn't hear from them after the first few days, I'll usually shoot them over a message just to see how everything went and if they need anything. And that, my friends, is what we do to list our units, find and screen tenants, and move them in. Whew. Guys, we covered a lot. I mean, it's dark outside. We've been here for a little while, and I know that we could have went down so many different avenues and covered so much more. I know I didn't touch on Section 8 tenants or the nuances when you're house hacking, so if you have any specific questions, please drop them down below. And like, subscribe, comment below. You guys know the drill. We will, because Kyle will be here next time. See you next week. Whew. Fantastic. You did a great job. Sorry. Impressed with you. Thank you.